What's up biology students, it's Mr. Holloway here, uh, and in today's video we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between scientific theories and scientific laws. And we're mostly going to focus on the theories part, we're going to talk about what a scientific theory is and why these are important tools. The word theories gets used a lot, and a lot of the time when I hear it used, especially on uh, television and in movies, I'm reminded of a scene from The Princess Bride in which this character named Vicini is using the word inconceivable. He didn't fall! Inconceivable! And another character in the movie, Inigo Montoya, turns to him and he says, You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. And theories is kind of the same way. Very often when people say theories in television and in movies and in our daily lives, what they mean is a hunch or a guess. But the fact of the matter is that the word theories means something very specific in science, and it's a lot more powerful and a lot more meaningful than just a hunch or a guess. Theories are big picture explanations, and one theory can explain a wide range of observations and phenomena. Theories are supported by a wide body of evidence collected by numerous scientists over a pretty long period of time usually, and theories are used to make predictions about new situations, and usually they're used uh, effectively and successfully to make predictions about those new situations, which is why we continue to use them. And if for some reason those theories fail to work or fail to make good, help us make good predictions about new situations, uh, then we revise them when that new evidence becomes available. On the other hand, there are a bunch of things that theories are not. Theories are not, for example, educated guesses or hunches. Theories are not any less important than scientific laws. Theories are not based on opinions or unprovable belief structures. Theories are not set in stone forever despite new evidence, and theories are not destined to become laws. So a lot of people have some pretty weird ideas about what a theory is, and you might even say some people, uh, <clears throat> you might even hear people occasionally say things like, oh, that's just a theory. People who say that's just a theory usually don't really understand what a scientific theory is, and if you look at that things, that list of things that theories are versus that list of things that theories are not, it becomes clear that theories are pretty powerful things. They're not just some idea that we came up with haphazardly. They're really powerful explanatory mechanisms that help us make predictions about things that we've never seen before. And that idea that theories are no less important than scientific laws is a pretty important one because a lot of people have this idea that theories are down here and, and laws are up here and somehow theories might become laws if they're good enough and that's really just not the case. Theories and laws are different but they're both very important tools in science. Uh, and to sort of explain the difference, let, let me give you an example. So if, when we talk about gravity, there's both a theory of gravity and a law of gravity. And the theory of gravity explains why we have gravity and where this force comes from. The law of gravity describes how an object moves under the force of gravity. So both of these are tools for explaining what gravity is and how it works, and they both help us to make predictions about what's going to happen if we toss a ball up into the air or shoot a rocket off into space but they explain different aspects of what gravity is and they're useful to us in different ways. So to help us better understand the role of theories in science, uh, let's go over an example that hopefully you're at least a little bit familiar with. Uh, and a theory that hopefully you've learned about before uh, is the theory of plate tectonics. And the theory of plate tectonics states that the Earth's land is made up of large tectonic plates that move due to currents of magma deep beneath the surface of the Earth. Now we call this a theory, but plate tectonics is something that we sort of take for granted and for good reason. It's because we've gathered numerous pieces of evidence over time uh, in numerous different scenarios by numerous different scientists and all of this evidence supports this theory that our planet is made up of these large plates which we can see uh, here in this picture and these plates are are moving around due to these convective currents of magma that we see here in this other picture uh, that are occurring even deeper in the earth below that 
And this theory helps us understand not only how the surface of our Earth has changed in appearance over time and how it's likely to continue changing in the future, but it also helps us make a lot of really important predictions and helps us explain a lot of really important uh, earthly phenomena. For example, the theory of plate tectonics helps us explain why earthquakes and volcanoes uh, occur where they do on the planet. And if you look here at this diagram and think about the diagram we just saw on the last page, we can see that uh, in terms of volcanic activity, we see an awful lot of volcanic activity right around the edges of these plates, uh, here, here, and here. And if we look at this map of earthquakes, we should also notice that we see a whole lot of earthquake activity right around the edges of those plates as well. So this theory of plate tectonics helps us understand why these things occur where they do, and it helps us understand that if they're going to occur again in the future, earthquakes and volcanic eruptions are going to happen on these plate boundaries. And that helps us uh, be prepared for the eventuality that these things may happen, uh, and helps us stay safe as a result. Plate tectonics also helps us explain how the arrangement of continents on Earth has changed over time. And you've probably heard of this idea that at some point in the past there was this supercontinent called Pangaea. And that over time that supercontinent broke up into a couple of smaller continents that we call Laurasia and Gondwana land. And over time those two supercontinents continued to break up into even more smaller and smaller pieces until we get the arrangement of continents that we are familiar with today. It also helps us predict how the continental arrangements are going to continue to change over time, and although they change very, very slowly, uh, it helps us understand how things like climate and weather and, and all of that kind of stuff may change over time as our continents continue to rearrange themselves. Plate tectonics also helps us to explain why we find similar geology and fossils from certain groups of organisms spread out across the continent. And if we look at these two figures here, we can see down here in uh, the bottom left corner that there are similar patterns of glaciation all throughout this region. And these continents obviously are not arranged like this anymore, but the fact that all of these continents have a pattern of glaciation uh, can be explained by the fact that these continents were once closer together in an arrangement like the one that we see here. If we look at the other side of our slide here, we can see this map, and you can see a bunch of areas where we find fossils from uh, one organism spread out across South America and Africa, fossils from another organism spread out across Africa, India, and Antarctica, fossils from yet other organisms spread out across South America, Africa, Madagascar, Antarctica, and Australia, uh, India too, I guess, and fossils from yet other organisms spread out across this region of South America and Africa. And it doesn't make a lot of sense that these organisms would just sort of appear on these continents if these continents were arranged the way they are now. Uh, and it's certainly not likely that these organisms swam across the ocean to get to these different continents. It's more likely that we find these fossils here because the continents were once arranged like this. And plate tectonics helps us to explain why that is. Plate tectonics also helps us to explain why the ocean floor is not all the same age. And for example, if we look at the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, we can see that there's this really long ridge, uh, appropriately called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, running down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And along that ridge, we find really, really new rock, really young rock, by comparison to the, uh, the rocks that we find on the outer edge of the Atlantic Ocean. And that's because in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, these tectonic plates are uh, moving apart from one another. And as these plates move apart from one another, magma is able to come up to the surface. That magma cools and forms solid rock. Uh, that also pushes these tectonic plates further and further away from one another, which is why the Atlantic Ocean is slowly getting wider over time. And to compensate for that, the Pacific Ocean is actually getting uh, slightly narrower over time. So... 
hopefully you can see why plate tectonics is a useful theory in the realm of earth science, but there are a lot of important biology theories that we're going to be learning about this year as well. Uh, and although we'll spend a great deal of time talking about each one of these theories as we encounter them over the course of the year, I wanted to give you a little bit of a preview for some of the things that we're going to be learning about, and especially some of the important theories that are going to come up from time to time as we learn about biology this year. For example, we're going to learn about cell theory, which tells us about uh, the role and the place of cells in living organisms. We're going to learn about the chromosome theory of inheritance that tells us how traits are passed from one generation to the next. We're going to learn about the germ theory of disease, which explains how infectious diseases are spread from one person to another and also helps us to understand how we can protect ourselves from diseases that are transmissible from one person to another. We're going to learn about endosymbiotic theory that helps us to explain where uh, parts of our cells, really important pieces of machinery that help us with photosynthesis and respiration, well, they don't help us personally with photosynthesis, but they help other living organisms with this process, and endosymbiotic theory helps explain where these important pieces of machinery came from. We're also going to learn about the central dogma of molecular biology, which I guess kind of qualifies as a theory, although it's more of an explanatory mechanism uh, that explains the relationship between DNA, RNA, and proteins. But since theories themselves are explanatory mechanisms, I think that the central dogma qualifies. We're also going to learn about the theory of evolution, which helps explain where the diversity of life came from, how it's changing over time, how it has changed over time, uh, and how it helps us to explain our place among the animal kingdom. Now remember, in our very first video of the year, we talked about how science is a way of knowing. And theories are a really important piece of that puzzle because theories are like our big picture idea that explain a lot of different observations and are capable of helping us make predictions in lots of different new situations. And with that, hopefully you understand a little bit better about why theories are such important tools in science. That's all for our video today. Feel free to go back and watch this video as many times as you need to until you feel like you understand the concepts. And we'll talk about this stuff some more the next time I see you in class. Inconceivable!